Okay, I'm Stephen McLaughlin, and today we're going to talk about biosensor technologies. Okay, so what are, what are biosensors? Well, biophysics has got a range of, of different biosensors, and essentially they are two components. You have something that's attached onto a surface, and then you're going to flow across as, as something in solution. So we're going to call that the analyte. The thing on the surface is called the ligand. Different biosensors are all based on, on different physical changes at the surface. Of course, you've all used biosensors. Of course, you didn't know you did, but you have, because in the last couple of years, you've probably done one of these. And these are essentially your biosensors. So you've got all the antibodies on the surface. You've also then got an analyte, which you made yourself from various extractions of your throat and your nose. That, of course, then, that of course then flowed by capillary action then through up to here. And then the output was, uh, then I have a capture of, of the antigen with um, another antibody and it's connected then to this uh, colloidal gold red antibody here. And of course, when you got clear, then there was just a, a uh, antibody capture of the antibody to show you that the antibody um, had flown through. Okay, so why do you want to do um, any of these kind of experiments? Well, simplest one is like you, people will come and say, you know, does, does A bind to B? Does my protein bind to whatever? You might kind of want to go a bit further and say, well, how strong does that bind? We do that by the dissociation complex. And then you might make, want to make mutations and say, um, you know, well, how does this affect? Do I know where the interface is? Especially, um, you know, in cases, say, where you've got a crystal structure or a cryogenic structure, you want to kind of interpret that structure. You might want to go a bit further in and say, um, okay, I want to do and understand the dynamics of the system by looking at the on one of the off rates. Um, or in one case, in the switch sense, we can actually look at the oh. diameter of, of the complex. So of course, well, why do we want to understand the dynamics? Well, the cell, I mean, is, is really very crowded and it's dynamics, things coming on and coming off. So we'd really, you know, to understand things at the molecular level, you really want to understand the details of the kinetics and the affinity. So the affinity itself is then, is, is not, is made up of these two constants here, and that's the dissociation rate constant and the association rate constant. So these on rates, if you've got two molecules coming together, are then dependent on concentration. The off rate is, is not dependent on concentration, it's just a constant. And, but this dissociation constant is quite crucial because it relates to the half-life of this complex, how long is it going to, how long is it going to stay together? And as we'll see later, then different different affinities can be made up of of different on and off rates. Okay, so there's an absolute plethora um, of of different companies making different biosensors, and there's more even on on this list here. But I'm only going to talk about these three because these are the three that we've actually got in the LMB. Okay, so the first one, let's just go over the kind of different systems and how they work. So the first one is surface plasma resonance. We've got a bicore T200 here, and that works by, it's got a chip surface here, and it's got glass, and then you've got a very, very thin gold layer, 15 nanom, uh, nanometers, and often then the kind of standard chip has got this dextron layer on top. It's in this, in this kind of plastic cassette format, which you then stick into the instrument. And then on one side, microfluidics clamp on, and that kind of forms four channels in series, or you can look at them singly. And on the other side, then a prism is, is clamped onto the glass side, and through which you're gonna shine light, light through. Okay, the next one is the octet. And again, it's got a, it's got a surface, let's have a look. Um, it's got a bio, bio compatible matrix. I don't know exactly what it is, but, um, and you're gonna mobilize things on the surface. And this is a, a different format in the fact that each biosensor comes as these little tips, which you can then, uh, they're racked up, put into the instrument, and then they go into a, 90, a 94, uh, sorry, 96 or 384 well format. And you can put the, you dip them in and then shake them around. And we're going to look at the, the output then is, is with, uh, with incident white light. The third one you know, is DNA nanolevers. And 
again, another little chip format here. And in this case, right, we've got uh, floor, four flow, flow channels here. You can kind of see in, in, the, in the dynamics here. And there's lots of these electrodes coming off. And so in of each of these flow channels, these four flow channels, there's six electrodes. And within those, each of those electrodes, and each of these little detection spots have got nanolevers here, and there's 0.01 per, per millimeter squared. And so there's a DNA attached onto the surface with the fluorophore to which you can conjugate um, another sequence with a molecule of interest. Okay, so how do they detect? So with, with SPR, right, we're going to uh, fire in polarized light, and then that's going to go underneath uh, you know, in internal reflection here. But it's also going to interact with this gold layer here. So, of course, light has not only got energy, but it's also got momentum. And so at a certain angle, that angular momentum of, the, of those photons will match the energy of the, of the electrons on the surface of the gold, this so-called plasma layer. So when the, the energy, the angular momentum of the, of the photons then match, then the plasma um, energy of these electrons here, then the electrons then absorb light, they resonate. And so at a certain angle, we then get a dip in the reflected light, so as here. So this, and uh, the minimum here, this is called the SPR angle. To also depend, this angle is dependent upon what's at the surface here, what the change in the reflective index is between the gold layer and what's in solution. So if anything attaches onto the surface, then you get a change in the angular SPR angle, and we're going to look at things flowing on and flowing off. In uh, octet, it's called biolayer interferometry. And so white light is shone all the way directly through the sensor down to the bottom, and it gets reflected back from the surface and from a reference layer. These will either undergo uh, uh, constructive or destructive interference. And so you'll end up with this pattern of interference. Right? And if anything binds onto the surface of the, of the sensor, you're going to get a change in how, how that those light uh, beams kind of interfere with each other. And you get a shift in the, in the wavelength here of where the maximum and minimum is. And of course, the nice thing about this, of course, it's not, you're not flowing anything across, you're actually dipping it into an six four well plate um, and you can use these kind of different volumes here um, and so you can have both the ligand and then a washing buffer and then analytes here and you can follow this through and uh, we get um, a change in form binding and association here and if you notice then that the the y-axis here is in nanometers and that's not in size that's actually in wavelength so switch sense a bit, a bit different. So you've got these DNA nanolevers on the surface here um, between these gold electrodes. And so here you're going to shine light down onto the surface of the electrode. And we're going to look at the fluorescence back. It's also then connected to a frequency generator and an event timer. So the nanolevers have, have got a, a fluorophore attached to the end that's attached onto the surface. And so when you have a positive charge here, the DNA then gets attracted to the surface. You get quenching of the fluorescence. When you flip, then the voltage to negative. Of course, they get repelled and they stand up and then you agree in the fluorescence. So this happens um, very, very fast. Um, it's in the tens to uh, kilohertz region. And so you're looking at in the microscale uh, time frame where you're getting, uh, you're looking at the, you can actually measure the rate of the nanolever standing up. And when you reverse the charge, then you can see it coming down again. And so if anything does kind of bind onto the surface um, of, of this fluorophore or, or onto the nanolever here, then that's going to slow how this movement back just by friction. And you can actually see then a change in the fluorescence um, in this dynamic response here. And it's the case of, of, of say biotin then attaching to an antibody here. You can do additional things then with uh, these nanolevers because not only can you look at the uh, the molecular dynamics here, but you can also then do a bit of proximity sensing. So if anything binds onto the, the DNA that's quite close to then the fluorophore, that can change the environment. As I talked about in the fluorescence a lecture, theater, lecture um, last week or a couple of weeks ago, that you can get this, this fluorescence uh, kind of proximity effect. 
And so you can look at then changes to just by fluorescence. So instead of looking at it in dynamic mode, you can just have the anomaly standing straight up. And additionally, what you can do is you can have one end that is it's not completely uh, in double strand, it's just in single stranded here. So if you had a polymerase or a nucleus or anything, you could you could then look at either the nanolever being uh, formed in the double stranded or being digested away. So overall, in all the kind of the, the different the different biosensors, you get these kind of these kind of traces. So you've got uh, something on the surface and it binds. You get association kinetics, and you may if it flattens off here, then that's where the dissociation and the association are, are the same. So you're getting at you're saying this is at equilibrium. And then when you wash off with buffer, then you get dissociation kinetics here. So if SPR, the signal is, is, is in resonance units. So a thousand resonance units is about one picogram uh, per millimeter squared. And that's an angular angle of one by 10 to the minus four. In octet, then it's nanometers. And that is then in shift in wavelength. And switch sense sends a rate of fluorescence recovery. So it's kind of dynamics of switching. Okay, different flavors of biosensors. Which one do you actually want to use? I mean, in terms of say, if you're looking at something small, then the SPR is very, very good for, for drug binding, octet, not so much. Switch sense, I don't know how haven't, we haven't really tried that. In terms of say the affinities, then, uh, then switch sense has actually got the best um, kind of dynamic range. And that's because it can, it can do really very, very well, kind of very, very high rates of dissociation and dissociation. If you want to look at, say, temperature, then that switch sense is very good. Um, the octet, um, really, it's just ambient temperature above. There's not very good temperature control on it. Um, and we can do everything in 96 well plates. And in the octet, then we can do three at four well plates, or so these tilted well plates where you can use very, very small amounts. OK. And the addition thing, then, with switch sense, you can do this. You can actually do sizing. Right. OK, so what's the disadvantages? Well, one is cost. You've got to buy these chips. They're quite expensive. Or you've got to buy racks of tips um, or the little ch chips with the nanolevers on. Of course, you've got a surface in there. So how is that going to affect the interaction? Obviously, you're mobilizing one component. So that's going to have a loss of, of rotational entropy. So how, how is that going to affect the interaction? You've got a surface as well. So a big problem is not specific binding of whatever you're flowing across. So, um, and that is obviously sometimes the killer for techniques. And that's why we have different biosensors because they've got different kind of non-specific binding affinity. So something that might work um, on the SPR might not work on the octet and vice versa. So we can kind of um, you know, change things. Um, there is a, a problem with, with, with measuring the, the rate. So if you've got a very, very slow rate, as we'll kind of see later, then it can be quite difficult to actually measure that um, in, say, SPR. The newer instruments, I think, have got over that problem, but the instruments that we've got, if you've got something that's very, very slow, quite difficult. Switch sense is great because it can just run and run. And as I'll show you in an example later, the high, high affinity interactions um, can be difficult to, to look at. So what's a usual kind of um, workflow? Well, you know, obviously, it's you got to get the you got to get the ligand on there somehow. You got to capture it, a couplet. You want to test at the binding, look at controls. Are you going to have affinity or kinetic interactions? And you got an issue of of fitting the data. So the first thing is like all everything we kind of bang on about here uh, during these lectures is having really really nice buffers and um, you know really nice samples. With the buffer, you really need to ensure that it's it's compatible with the system. With um, SPR, you really want to match the injection sample, uh, the analyte, what you're going to inject in with the running buffer because to minimize any refractive changes. So that could be a big issue if you've got DMSO or you've got detergent or things like that. Um, you know, make sure it doesn't, have, for switch sense, it doesn't have too much salt. If you're going to, as we'll see later, attach things by um, amines and you need to avoid tris. Okay, with your protein samples, then again, make sure they're nice, spin them down, make sure you've got accurate concentrations, you're gonna do kinetics or binding. Um, also, you know, which way do you do it? 
you've got two, two components potentially. You've got a ligand and a lanolite, and you're going to choose which, which one to put onto the chip surface and one flow across. Often it can be that, well, one component you can't make enough of, or it, it aggregates at high concentration, so that's the one you're going to put onto the surface. In an ideal world, you would do it both ways around, so that then you can see if there's any, any change in how you, how you attach. So how much do you put on? Well, to kind of stop any kind of non-specific interaction with whatever you're on the surface, it's always good to have a, a low amount. So for uh, the T200, um, you would say maybe an R max of, 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 of birdie. So when I say R max, then that's the maximum response in units. And how much then you put on depends upon this little formula down here at the, at the bottom. And essentially, it means that if you've got something very, very small, say you've got a small molecule binding onto um, a protein attached on, onto there, you're going to need to put a lot of the protein on the surface to get a good enough response. But if, say, you have, say, um, you know, something small and you're, you're binding a mega Dalton complex, because you're going to attract a big, big mass onto that surface, you're going to get a big change. So you don't really need to put very much on there at all. The nice thing about Octet um, is the fact that everything can be done in parallel. So you don't really need to kind of go, well, how, guess how much you need to put on. You can actually just do a, a kind of a preliminary experiment where you can then vary the, the amount of, of ligand here and you're going to attach onto the, onto the tip and then have to say a constant amount of the analyte and then see what kind of response you kind of get. So maybe a kind of a one to in four would be like, you know, one nanometer, um, you know, over five minutes. Switch sense, you're kind of limited by the amount of, of uh, nanolevers on there. So you've got, you know, typically then we'll put in about 100 to 500 nan nanomolars of DNA coupled ligand. Um, and say if you've got a bit of the issue, then you can actually have a lower level by ever competing that with a complementary strand or doing this electroporation. We can then um, basically reduce the density um, of, of the nanolevers. And here that's kind of going, you know, it's even when it's high then it's really, really, you know, very, very small compared to back or, um, and you can reduce the density even, even more. And that will increase the, the average distance then between um, the nanolevers and hence kind of avoid any uh, valency issues. So how do we get things on? Well, there's two kind of main methods. One would be capture. So you've got a molecule on the surface that will then capture your ligand. Um, and there's going to be things like streptavidin or antibodies or NTA and or streptavidin um, for biotin. Um, of course, the, the advantage of that is that in the majority of the cases, you can wash off the ligand again. So each round of, of binding analysis, you can wash, wash it off, except of course for streptavidin and biotin, which is just pretty permanent. If you want to kind of do a permanent way, then that is um, quite, you know, obviously you can cross-link or you can file, file couple. Um, obviously the advantages of say, of, of say doing a, say a capture, is that you're refreshing, refreshing things every, every time. So if your protein tends to, you know, it's going to degrade or, or say some subunits are going to fall off, then obviously do, it'd be nice to refresh it every time. But it may be that you've got something you don't have very, very much. And then in this of ligand, so in this case, you would just hopefully be able to cross-link and then it'll be permanently on the chip and you can do lots of experiments. Variety of chips to actually for SPR. Um, kind of the bog standard is the CM5 chip. And then there's various different ones here with, with different levels of dextran. Um, you know, so here is like, uh, if you've got nosovic binders, you can have a lower degree of, 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 of uh, dextran. So you've got low amounts of oxidation, or if you've got a much denser uh, dextran layer here for the molecule work, alternative, there, there's PEG here. Or you can have a very, if you've got very, very big things, you can have a very shortened dextrin layer or you know, very, very flat surface here. And you kind of use the CM1 chip. Um, so affinity tags, there's, there's, there's chips that are already um, kind of coupled with, with different things or you can use it for hydrophobic lipids um, and a range of antibody uh, capture molecules, as you kind of see in Similarly here with, with the octet, it's got a similar kind of range of everything. Um, and you can see here as well, there's, there's again, 10 tons of, of different antibody 
And that kind of shows you that actually in, in biopharma, these biosensor techniques are used extensively to kind of analyze illnesses. And so for similarly with, with the uh, switch sense, then again, you can, you can do a range of, of coupling um, to get a complementary strand onto your, onto your molecule um, and different capture, mo different capture molecules that already have this the complementary strands on there. And again, antibody specific things as well. And again, even fancier chips for bifunctional chips or enzyme chips. So for amine coupling, then what we do is we put these crosslinkers onto the surface and that they then react with the carboxyl groups in the dextran. Um, and so this is activated. And then, so when a protein comes along, um, you then will we'll get coupling uh, covalent bond here. So for file coupling, you can then modify with this uh, group here, this BDIA, which is a good then leaving group for, for cysteine, or alternatively, you can do this via malamide coupling. So when you come uh, to couple in, in Biocore, then a good, good thing to do is, is to do a bit of pH scouting. And the reason for that is because we can take advantage of the fact that we've got this boxylate layer on the surface. It's going to be negatively charged. So if you put the protein below its PI, the protein is going to become positively charged. It'll be attracted to the surface just by charge. And in this case here, then you can see, well, how much, how much is going on you know, per minute? And we're looking kind of for linear, rate, linear rates. So we can then kind of judge, how, well, how much do we have in a couple for, for how long to get the amount of units we're looking for? And this would be kind of a, a, kind of a typical result where you're putting the crosslinker on, and then you're injecting in at a, a low pH for a certain amount of time. Um, and then not all, all of it then is cross-coupled because then when you go in the buffer, something comes on. And you can block any remaining crosslinker then with, with an uh, ethyl, um, ethyl amine, amine solution here. NTA, just like the chip, just like a, a little column that you would purify your protein on, you just charge it with nickel. Um, Streptavidin, if you've got a biotin dated uh, ligand, it just goes on and it will come off again. So that's quite good. Specialized ones we, we kind of use if you've got looking at membrane um, interactions, then there's a hydrophobic chip where you can then layer on um, liposomes on, 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 on the surface here. And uh, an L1 chip where we shall actually capture liposomes and then you can look at molecules and binding onto these liposomes. So for switch sense, um, the way you get things on, so you've got a nanolever with a defined sequence. And so one strand is actually attached onto the surface. So if you then take your, your protein or whatever you want, um, and you then couple that with that complementary sequence, then that will anneal on here. Of course, if you're looking at DNA binding proteins, then you don't really need to anneal. You can just have um, you know, anything kind of complementary and you can have a single strand kind of coming off or double strand coming off. And again, to make these kind of couplings here, then there's, there's different chemistries and different tags to do that. Again, there's different chips. So there's multipurpose chips with either 48 or 96 base pair uh, nanolevers. Um, so if you've got something really big, then you go for a 96 uh, base pair nanolever because then that's you know, when that kind of binds, it's not going to disrupt the kind of, the, 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 the kind of dynamics of, of the, uh, this laying down onto the surface. Um, enzyme chips then will have a kind of a single strand and kind of extension, um, which you can then look at nucleus activity or polymerase activity. And they do sell uh, kind of bifunctional chips here where you can have two different strands um, to attach two different molecules onto the surface. And in your instruments, then they're developing these kind of big, large DNA origami things. Right. Okay. So you've got something on the surface. Let's kind of test the binding. Let's do some controls and let's look and see. Um, is it non-specific binding? And can we regenerate the surface um, on there? So for in the, in the biocore, then there's a channel which you leave blank. It's usually the, the first channel um, in a, uh, because you can either run, there's four flow channels, you can either run these in series or you can run these individually. So, um, or, you know, or go all the way through. So we'd usually take, take the first channel, either channel one here, or channel three as a, as a reference. And the reason for that then is that you, if there is any kind of bulk refractive index changes here on, we can take care of that. So here in, in with nothing, no ligand on there in surface one, 
you can see there's a, a bit of a step, which is a block of active index change. And we see that then underneath, then the interaction uh, on, on, on flow channel two. So when we take two away, uh, one away from two, then we'll get uh, a nice kind of trace here. And here's an example here we're using GST. So the GST and the GST antibodies on both of uh, channel one and channel two. And then on channel one, we're just gonna capture some GST. Channel two, we're gonna capture then a GST fusion protein. Um, and we do that kind of sing, doing that from a single channel. So we just flow through one or, or flow through two. Then when we've got both of those on the surface then we go flowing down like through both channel one and channel two. So you can see a background here on channel one. And then this is the, uh, the interaction on channel two. We take two away from one. We also put in a zero buffer injection here because you can see sometimes there's this little machine kind of flips and blobs, which we can take away. So then we'll do what's called double referencing and then fit. So often, I'm going to go back again. Right. So often um, what we'll have to do, is you can see we're doing multiple cycles. These are all different concentrations of analyte. And at the end of the um, injection here, um, we then put another solution here which then disrupts the interaction between the GST, GST fusion, and the antibody. So we want to get the background down here to very, very down to zero again. So we can then do another round of injections of the GST, GST fusion. Um, and so that, therefore one chip, you can use that multiple, multiple times. Of course, for antibodies, uh, antigens, lowering the pH, that's quite an easy thing. The antibody survives, you can capture again quite well. So that would be kind of this case here where we've uh, injected the regeneration solution. We've got back to the baseline, injected the session, second analyte and got a, a nice response. Sometimes then if you don't regenerate, you get a poor response, you know, poor, you don't get down to background, you don't get a second poor response um, because there's, there's stuff on the surface. So the regeneration kind of, uh, kind of solutions may be like salt, pH, detergent, what you don't want to happen is um, in the second one where, okay, you get down to baseline, you've got all the analyte, all the analyte off. When you do a second injection, right, it's, you don't get a very good response. And that's because you basically destroyed the ligand, which whatever solution. So, um, and that's often then why you, know, you, you need four channels because then you can just go into the other second set of channels. So we can avoid those kind of problems with um, single cell. Um, I'm sorry, single cycle kinetics. And of course, in the, in the octet, that's not an issue because you've got individual sensors. You bugger up one sensor, you're just going to throw them away at the end, end of the day anyway. So, so in BioCore, then you do the single cycle uh, kinetics. So here's multiple cycles. Um, and so you were generating, going back to the beginning again and injecting more concentrations. Here, then you're just injecting increasing concentrations of the analyte. And you're only looking at this dissociation right at the end. And in this case, we kind of end up, it doesn't really matter which way you do it, you get pretty similar kind of analysis. Okay, so we've got, um, we've got good binding. And with Biocore, then there's an issue of mass transport. You've got this dextran layer, right? And so you're going to flow on land across, across it. Your, your ligand is attached onto the dextran layer. So the, the analyte molecules have got to diffuse into this into this kind of matrix. And so if, if that becomes limiting, then you get a mass transport issue in association. So essentially the flow isn't fast enough to replenish things that are, are being depleted um, as, as they kind of come in. During dissociation, if say you've got a very, very high density of, very high density here of, of ligand on the surface, you may get rebinding. So things may dissociate from the ligand, and then before they can get out into the bulk, they rebind as well. So this is all dependent on the flow rate. And so a way you can tell if you've got kind of mass transport issues is just by changing the flow rate. In this case, you can see uh, on the left, there's a then, again, a, a, kind of uh, a flow rate dependence on the association. In this case, there's no mass transport. So we have high flow rates. We use kind of a, a low amount, a, a relatively low amount of the mobilized ligand. Um, we can fit um, you know, mass transport variables in, in the data, but obviously more variables uh, can fit uh, worse data better. So it's best to avoid if you can. Um, in terms of BLI, the controls you do, because you're doing in parallel, you can then have different, different things in different sensors. 
So here um, in this ligand column here, you could have one that doesn't have any ligand attached. And in say the analyte row here, you could have just kind of buffer. So what we'll see here is on where you've got no immobilized uh, ligand, then you don't see you don't see very much happening here. You see this background kind of drift. And here's the loading, we've got interaction. And here then with the, uh, we've got no, it's just buffer here. You can see what the background kind of binding um, of the analyte is, or sorry, what the, what the machine noise is here. And here is kind of will be the, the background binding of the analyte to the, to the surface. Another way of doing it is you can do this in, in say in parallel, where you could have, because we've got a, uh, the red fiat four, you can run 16, 16 um, sensors at once. So you could have say two columns of, of ligands where you have then one center, one sense, set of sensors of it going into ligands and the other going to buffer. And then you put those into, into, into then two sets of analyte. And then you can then in real time then see the, the background binding. In built into the switch sense is a controller within each of the spots. We've got the two color version. So we've got, um, one set of, uh, of nanolevers have got a red fluorophore and the other side have got a green. So you can, because they've got different sequences and then different complementary strands will actually bind, you can have one then as a, as a reference with nothing bind onto it. And then the other one you've got conjugated to your molecule of interest. And so then you can actually you know, directly compare what the non specific binding is just to the DNA itself. So how do we over, overcome kind of, we do get um, any, and an specific binding. Well, you can change the chip. If it's say dextran layer, then you could, you could use say, you know, a CM4 instead of a CM5, use a PEG chip. You can, you know, cross-link the chip with, with PEG, change the pH of the salt of the running buffer, maybe put some detergent in there, um, twin, you know, block with say BSA or PEG or casein, um, and also, you know, EDTA. But, Cytiva then also sell this thing called N NSB, so non-specific binding reducer, which is just essentially soluble uh, methyldextrin. And for streptavidin surfaces, you know, you put in biotin, or of course you can always put in um, another protein of interest that is isn't going to isn't going to bind or another DNA sequence. So we're doing affinity in kinetics um, for kinetics, then you need at least five concentrations so you can get a a whole range of different uh, observed kinetics. Affinity, you need more. You need to really go through the, through the KD. So you need to be able to kind of be below five times below the KD and five times above the KD. So you need at least 12. Um, of course, in an aggregate concentration range across there, do other things in duplicates or triplicates and include one or two buffer controls as well. So what kind of kinetics are you gonna get? Oh, it depends upon, um, the, uh, you know, what the underlying individual rates are. So as I kind of was saying earlier on, that, you know, each affinity can be made up of different individual association and rate uh, constants here. So here's one at, at 10 nanomolar. And you can see that, well, if you have a look first in say blue, then this is very fast on, but very fast off. And if you go down all the way down to then red, you can see, well, this is much slower on but much slower off. And of course, because this is much slower off, it's going to then uh, be in contact with the, with the target for a much long, longer time. So that can be important in say, in potentially in, in drug binding. So here's a, here's, here's a study here where you've got uh, the log of K off here and the log of K on here. And these parallel uh, lines here are all different affinities. So if we have a look at two, uh, Two little spots in this, uh, this high throughput screen here. They've both got the similar um, affinity. So they're in between these two, uh, one micromolar and uh, 100 micro, uh, micromolar. And you can see that, well, if you look at the individual kinetics, compound one here is pretty much fast on, or sorry, slower on, slower off. While compound two um, is, is up here, is much faster off and much faster on. So this one is obviously going to be in associated with the target for much longer. Okay, so at the extremes, you're gonna get these two, two types of, of kinetics in. One, we kind of say fast on, fast off. So because it's so fast, it's, it's, it's faster than the instrument can actually measure. So you get these kind of step functions 
And we're going to then look at the equilibrium position here against concentration. And with kinetics, then you're going to you know, slightly slower on, slower off. And so it's not flattening out. You're not getting flat equilibrium position, except for maybe at very high concentrations. And so we're going to need to analyze the kinetics. So first of all, you're going to subtract the reference uh, binding, and then you're going to do a double reference by subtracting the zero concentration, the buffer control. And then we're going to put it into this different programs that usually come with the, uh, the instrument. Um, but often enough, then I will just export everything and then put it into Prism and put it myself. And we'll see, talk about that later in the data fitting one. Um, so here in, in Switch Sense, it comes with its own software and you can just kind of fit uh, the data. And as you can see, it, it goes the opposite direction to what we've been seeing before. So when something binds, the nanolever gets slower. And then when something dissociates, then it gets, it gets faster. And so we can either fit the data either locally, so each individual concentration, and then we get an average, or you can kind of fit a global fit where it's going to fit all the different concentrations um, and one dissociation here. With switch fence as well, you can do um, sizing. It takes a kind of a model. It assumes that whatever is on the end of the nanolever is kind of like a lollipop. And it can look at the, the uh, so they've got a model to then model the, dif the, the frictional diffusion of that from the dynamics um, and it will give you a it will actually give you then a, a diameter but okay back to everything else then in terms of the kinetics so in the first one uh, we're going to look at steady state so we're just looking at the response then when this flattens out so the secret room position the association and the association are the same so there's no change in the actual signal at these concentrations you just uh, map this against different concentrations Fitting to this will give you uh, the association rate const association constant, which is just the inverse of the association constant. With kinetics, it's a bit more involved because you've got two phases here. Okay, you've got the association, which depends upon the association and the dissociation rate constant. And then you've got the dissociation phase here, which is just dependent on the individual dissociation rate. There's lots of different models you can invoke. Um, but of course, we'll talk about that later in the data fitting ones about you know, good models and bad models. But let's just look at a simple one to one to start off with. Um, so the first one here is, OK, we're increasing the analyte concentration here. We're getting different kinetics. And we want to find the KD then from different in, by fitting the individual dissociation and association rate constants. So here, it's very simple. The association just dependent upon the observed. Um, Dissociation exponential then is dependent on this rate constant. But here, this is dependent on both the association rate constant and dissociation rate constant. You can see this is kind of similar to the, the it's a bit similar in, in equation then to the, the steady state. We can see it, so it's dependent upon the association and, and the disso dissociation rate constant. So what happens if your dissociation rate constant is wrong? Here's an example. This was very, very, this is a, a pub, this was uh, repeating a published work. So here is the, the association, and you can see it's, the association is very slow. I mean, it's a, essentially like a flat line. That's because, you know, it's an exponential, and if you, you, you look very, very, at a very, very short time frame on a very, very slow rate, it just looks linear. But the computer will still fit, and you get um, a KD of approximately 30 nanomolar. So that looks very, very, very tight. That was, that was a published value. But another, another way you can actually fit and look at this is say, well, let's look at the association rate constant. Um, because then this is, because this got information on both the association and the association rate, rate constant. We're just going to look at observed um, rate constant, the observed kinetics here. And, um, you know, just a simple exponential. And then we're going to fit that then against the concentration. And it's a one-to-one, -one. you can fit this to a straight line where the observed rate constant, um, the observed rate is then dependent upon linearly upon uh, the association rate constant times the concentration. And then the intercept is gonna be the dissociation rate constant. So if we do that, we fit, fit it that way, then we actually get um, a dissociation or a, a, so rate constant, or a dissociation constant of 1.8 micromolar um, so it's an order, you know, more than order of magnitude 
different from the kinetics, and that was similar to, to then the ITC. So in all, all kind of cases, then it's always a, a good thing to kind of choose the simplest model. Of course, you can you can you know put a, a you know you can get your data, bad data, and then fit a complicated model to it or fit it because it's bad data. And then you but then you have to kind of think, well, what's what's why is, why is that going on? You know, is the fit is the fit good? Um, you know, look at the standard errors, look at the residuals, look at the chi squared, you know, don't invoke a complicated model just because the data looks better. Because you've got to come back and go, well, does this actually make any sense? So here's a here's here's a quick example in the last 15 minutes, I'll show you the examples of what we've done um, here at the Allen Bay. So this this first one was with the Barford group, and we've got this huge, you know, 20 subunit. Um, e free uh, ring lung ring, uh, ring uh, colon ligase. Um, that's really important in the cell cycle. And so it's an E free ligase and it then binds onto its E2 ligase here. So you can see it's, it's very complicated, very highly regulated. And so we wanted to know, you know, between the, the APO and the ternary complex, how did that, how did that affect? Than the interaction. So we had um, two ways of doing it. We couldn't really attach this onto the surface because of the 20 subunits. We weren't really sure, you know, would they all survive? Would they all, would, would things fall off? You know, would, would it remain kind of ternary? So then make biotinylated uh, the E2, attach it onto the surface and streptavidin. So, you know, you just go, right, have I got enough? Let's inject more, inject more, inject more to kind of get a good level. Unfortunately, then when we put in the APC, lots of non-specific binding, and that was like, oh, yeah, it was going to be a killer. So then trying lots of different additives to then kind of get that, that uh, non-specific binding down to kind of get um, to an acceptable level. Often in all these, all these experiments, you'll always have a little bit of non-specific binding, but as long as it's not, too much and you've got a really good positive signal on, on the non-reference one and you can take that away and, and, and ignore it. In this case we couldn't, right. So the nice thing again about running these kind of experiments is that um, you know it's very much hands-off. You kind of it's all computer controlled. So here you can you know you just got wizards to kind of say right uh, this is what I want to do this kind of experiment I want to run and you just you know ask you to fill in everything. It will, you know, lay out, you know, what you need to put into the, into the sample holder, and then you just let it run, and it will run, you know, twenty four hours. Um, so in this case, then you, you get, uh, you know, you get all the kind of the data out. You need to uh, process that data, and you can fit the data in the program itself. Or in my case, then I fitted that, that in Prism, because then I could I could fit it every which way. Um, and so this was the ternary, and then this was the IPO, it's quite different, slightly different kinetics. We could also then look at the equilibrium position because it was kind of, it was there for both of them and see a difference. And then actually look at the observed rate constants of the association um, and then fit everything out. And kind of very pleasingly then, you know, we could see that uh, both by equilibrium method and the, and the kinetic method, then the KD was in the nanomolar range and it's much, much tighter than, than the IPO range there. And here's an example of doing lichen screening. This data is from um, Javier um, in a second. So with lichen screening, obviously you've got a small molecule. It's got to, you know, you're going to have to put lots onto the surface. Um, you can do this in screen a library of, of 96 or 4 well plates, and you can do free proteins in parallel. But often these small molecule libraries come with DMSO. DMSO, if you've got a slight change in that, so that's going to change the refractive index. Um, which you then get a, a signal, which is going to be relatively big compared to the small molecule because the small molecule is small mass, so you don't get much of a change. So it could be something like, you know, here where you're only getting a, a few kind of resonance units. But with the, with the biocore, then you can then do solvent correction by then injecting in lots of different concentrations of, of DMSO, and then the program will, will then correct for that in your analysis. Um, so it's always good in these kind of ones to, um, if you're if you're going to screen a library, is to have positive and negative controls. Um, and so here you can see what the the, the the positive was here and the negative here, so that when you get a, a binding, you can then you know judge well 
you know, what is what is actually really binding and what's just noise and what here is, is probably either getting up here. Um, and here's, here's a, an example of, of COVID or our friend again. And in this one, we, they had the ACE, ACE2 receptor then on, uh, fused to an FC receptor, which would then bind protein A. Um, so we have sensor tray here. We have a sample uh, here where we've, we're going to then uh, have, uh, say, uh, ligand and then analyte different concentrations here. So in parallel, what we could attach on uh, the S2, then put it into the spike protein. And in this case, I, there's, a, there's a, a zero concentration here, but because uh, we could disrupt uh, this interaction between the S2, FC and, and protein A with uh, pH, you could just regenerate that, that, those surfaces, those tips, and then run, uh, run that again without then putting any, um, is two on the surface, and so we could look at the background binding at all. So there was hardly any background binding at all. Um, so we could then uh, take the data uh, binding onto the, onto the spike protein, adjust it here, and then uh, put the data to give us you know what the binding was. And of course, here in this case, you can see that it's really really slow off, and that's why it's such a good virus. So switch sense. Slightly different. You will each round. You have to you have to make the nanolever. So you start off with a just a bare nanolever on the surface. That's this is the one with attached with the fluorophore. You then uh, put in your complementary strand with whatever is on the surface attached onto it. You get double stranded DNA, which you and then you can then put in your analyte in, and you kind of go round. And here's an example from uh, Roy Passmore's group. It's with um, James Stoll. So they're looking at um, they were looking at RNA this RNA binding protein. And so this domain they knew was the RNA binding, but there was up this upstream region as well, which they uh, you know wanted to know. Well, does does this have any kind of function? It seemed to be very well conserved. So they made two constructs, uh, just the domain itself, and then a bit of an upstream region. So from you know polarization experiments where they used um, just labeled RNA, they could see that, yeah, with the upstream region, you got a massive change in uh, affinity. So then they made a DNA-RNA hybrid to go on to the switch sense. So here's the, uh, the two domains flowing on, on, on there. Um, so this is association rates. And you can see that they're, they're pretty similar. But if we have a look at the dissociation, then we could see that but for just the domain by itself, it was falling off in about minutes, while when you have the upstream region, then that was taking you know, 300, uh, you know, 300 minutes. It was taking hours to come off. And if we look at then the, the, then the reason for this change in, in, in association um, is because then the chaos was much, much slower by two orders of magnitude. Other ways of kind of doing uh, using switch sense, if you've got something that is polymerizes, then you can actually look at the entire cycle of looking at the binding um, elongation and also the exonuclease and then how much it comes off. You can do some temperature dependence as well. And so you're going to tease out then the, all these individual kinetic rates um, as this kind of example um, is shown here. And you can also then look at also the mechanical kinetics. Okay, so lots of, information out there. If you have a look at the bio, if you're internal, then have a look at the biophysics website. Um, we've got lots of some information on, on the biophysics ones and then lots of links. And then these are the links to uh, either the manufacturer or this is a kind of a user site here, SPR pages. That's it for today. Thanks for your attention.